Well, brethren, as we have already learned, there are various remnants in today's world of the true Church of God. We know there are seven church eras, and we know that this last one, the dominant one, is the lukewarm era of the Laodiceans. However, keep in mind, as we have already analyzed, there are other remnants there as well. There is a remnant of Thyatira Church, and Christ says that he will thrust their children with that Jezebel the symbolic woman he'll trust them into the great tribulation so there are still remnants of the middle ages you might say the church which was dominated by the valdensians who today sadly those who are just remaining are mostly sunday keepings and part of ecumenical movement then there is the sardis church which says you know you have a name that you are alive but you're basically losing you're losing the uh, truth, the biblical truth, which means that uh, they're alive, but you know they might just die because of losing the truth so much. And it seems to me that the Sardis Church is also getting more involved into ecumenical movement and all of those things, but time will show. Then we have the Philadelphian remnant, wherever it is. The Philadelphian remnant is uh, to be spared it's the promise of jesus christ that it will be spared from the this great tribulation that is just about to just about to happen i don't know how close we are but uh, but anyway it seems we're getting closer certainly with every week week by week and soon we'll have the full holidays holiday by holiday we are certainly closer to the return of christ and uh, very soon we're going to be reminded of jesus christ and his return because the Yom Teruach, or the uh, holiday of the uh, of the blast, or the trumpet blast, is just ahead of us. We call it generally Feast of Trumpets. And then also there is the remnant, of course, the dominant dominant uh, church remnant today is the remnant of the Laodiceans, who are just lukewarm. And it's not only the, I would say, brotherly love that is just lukewarm, and that's characteristic of there that church it's uh, the lack of the lack of uh, zealous love for god and for god's truth and we mentioned already i think last last week that uh, there are three great advantages that the laodiceans today simply are so lukewarm one is the prosperity of our end time and the second reason is the evil of the end time uh, if you go to Matthew 24 and verse 4 to 12, it's the verse I think that scares me more, more than anything else in the Bible. What Jesus Christ had to say about this end time generation and because of the wickedness that is upon it, Matthew 24, 12, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And of course, brethren, we see a society that is becoming more and more heartless, more and more calloused, more and more dog eat dog but uh, once again there is the application to the church because brethren this book the bible was written for us not for the world that is blinded it says because iniquity shall abound the love of many shall wax cold you know there are those in the church who are hot in their love for god or at least in their first love for god who will allow themselves to wax totally cold and commit the unpardonable sin. But in between, being you know, going from hot to cold is lukewarm. There are those who allow themselves to become lukewarm, as Jesus said in Revelation chapter 3, verse 15, to them, I know your works, that you are neither hot nor cold. I would that you were, that you were either hot or cold, you know, that you were either one that you were one or the other and so then because you're lukewarm i'll have to spit you or as it is in the greek i am about to spit you out of my mouth now when jesus christ spoke those words to and the apostle john wrote them there were hot springs a certain distance away from the city of laodicea and the water was transported from those hot springs to the town but by the time the water reached Laodicea, it was lukewarm. There is also the application spiritually, that a person can be on fire for God, meaning being hot, or they can be spiritually cold. And when Jesus Christ says in this case, I wish that you were one or the other, at least with the cold of this world, they are not you know, being cold, 
this is not their day of salvation their time of calling is yet future so if they die terrible as that will be in the tribulation at least it is not the end for them they're not spiritually accountable because this is not their day of salvation but the person that has God's spirit and is lukewarm is in jeopardy because it is the matter of their eternal life or death and so we can see why spiritually Jesus Christ would say I would that you were cold or hot if you're hot I know I can put you in the first resurrection if you're cold uncold I am going to wait for a better day to call you after my return but because you're cold and you're not lukewarm it's now or never sorry because because you are cold and you are lukewarm it's now or never and you put me in a terrible difficult situation and decision says God in a sense and that decision has to be as he says unless there is a, there is repentance I have to spit you out of my mouth implied into the great tribulation because that is the only way that uh, God could save them spiritually and get them into his kingdom if you go to Isaiah chapter 5 talking about the evil of the age and its effect upon people in God's church a slow subtle pernicious effect because Satan has done his job well with this end time society as it becomes more and more wicked all around us so in Isaiah 5 and verse 20 it says a famous verse I think we all know it woe to those who call evil good and good evil those that put darkness for light and light for darkness that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter you know this is an apt description of our societies indeed they woe to them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight who have no need for Christ in their lives so you might say they're liberated individuals in in their own mind woe to them that are mighty to drink wine and many strength to mingle strong drink which justify the wicked for reward then then verse 23 and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him now the actual meaning there is that they will justify the wicked for reward for a bribe and they will neglect to give the righteous their just cause for example in a court of law however by extrapolation we could take literally verse 23 who take away the righteousness of the righteous from him because if we individually are not close to God brethren if we then we will gradually be sucked into the vortex of this world and gradually we would lose our righteousness this world can take our righteousness away from us if we allow it to do so if you go to the book of Nehemiah I just want you to pay attention to one verse in chapter 13 verse 26 you see we have been blessed with the gift of God's understanding and uh, we do understand the end time prophecy we have blessed been blessed with understanding of the commandments of God and the real way to live and the true Jesus Christ we have been blessed with tremendous wisdom and the principles for right living but we can allow the world by the degeneracy and by its evil influence to begin to subtract from us righteousness before God so in Nehemiah chapter 13 and verse 26 in this verse we read did not Solomon king of Israel sin by these things you know Solomon a man of tremendous wisdom yet among many nations was there no king like him who was beloved of God God made him king all over Israel nevertheless even him did outlandish women cause to sin now brethren in the true analysis no one causes us to sin we sin by ourselves but when the Bible is stating what the Bible is stating is we can allow others to have that influence upon us whereby indirectly they cause us to sin and to give up and little by little we give up on our righteousness and so there are those in the church who will as the Bible says grow weary in well-doing and gradually they would allow their love that was once hot to become lukewarm so that is the second reason why the Laodiceans reject the great advantages of living in the end-time church the third 
absurdly enough, is the return of Jesus Christ. Well, the return of Jesus Christ is not by itself, but the enthusiasm for his, for his return. And the excitement that one should naturally feel for the bridegroom to come, for his bride. And I hope that uh, for the Feast of, uh, for the feast of uh, Trumpets, I will be able to deliver to you a, a message on what kind of bride would Jesus Christ, Christ like to marry. So anyway, the third cause, the third factor that the Laodiceans kind of reject the advantages of people living in the end time church is that some people, many people, get unexcited about the return of Christ is the return of Jesus Christ, or more accurately, the fact that the return of Christ does not come when they expect it to come. You might remember that was the problem of the first church era. Now, in Matthew chapter 24, and we'll start in verse 42. Matthew 24 and verse 42. Um, Matthew 24. We have already referred to verse 12, and this is the Olivet prophecy of the end time. What Jesus Christ said here had application to the apostles, the to the apostolic era, to the Ephesian era of the church, and it, it, it did have a fulfillment. But the major thrust of this prophecy is for our time, brethren, for our time in the 21st century, yet it is applied to all Christians through the last 2,000 years, but especially to us. Verse 42, Watch therefore, Jesus warned us, for you know not what hour your Lord does come, but know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. If he had known, you know, the future of the, to the point of knowing when Jesus Christ would return, if he had known the year of the tribulation and the month when it would begin, he would have prepared himself. He would have been ready. And we know it is coming, we know it is close, but because it is still distant, because it is not fully in our mind, because we don't know the exact time, we may take it easy and wait for events of the future to stir us up, like, you know, events of the future, the appearance of the European super dictator, prior to that, uh, the, uh, the war in the Middle East, and so on. But the problem with the Laodicean is that, you know, they wait for things to kind of speed up in the world. But the problem with the Laodiceans is that they wait too long. Verse 44. Therefore, be you also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. Who then is that faithful and wise servant whom his Lord has made him ruler over all his household to give, him, to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he comes, shall find so doing. Verily I say to you, he shall make him the ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delays his coming, and certainly that was the problem with the Ephesian, Ephesian era. That is why Jesus Christ said they lost their first love, because they had thought Jesus Christ was going to come back in their lifetime, and uh, then he did delay his coming. Yet, if you think about it, brethren, he never has truly delayed it. Because God is punctual, God will be on time. But because they made the mistake of putting it too early, there were those who fell prey to this. And this has happened throughout the last 2,000 years. But in the original, there were no chapter breaks, for example. So you have verse, uh, you have chapter 24, and then chapter 25, verse 1, they just continue naturally without any breaks. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened to ten virgins. And the parable of the ten virgins is for our day. So then you see the scripture just flows on. Chapters 24 and 25 belong together. There is a flow from verse 51 to verse 1 of chapter 25. 
Then shall the kingdom of God be likened to the ten virgins. And it goes to talk about the return of Jesus Christ. So we have these three reasons why the Laodiceans reject the three great advantages of being called in this time. The first one, the prosperity of this age. Second, the evil of this age. And uh, the fact that Jesus Christ, in their minds, has delayed his coming. They think they've got a few more years left and, uh, you know, can take it easy now. And then they can, you know, get stirred up when the things will start to get hectic and when they will start to get closer to or when they start to be a little warm but brethren they are going to wait one day too late there is no deathbed repentance with god because none of us can wait till the last day and suddenly get zealous and say okay well god i'm philadelphia now now you can take me to the place of safe a place of safety tomorrow well god is going to say forget it i'm not fooled i'm not fooled because the only reason why you have become uh, as zealous is to save your skin you haven't been zealous out of concern for you know for the right reasons out of concern and compassion for a dying humanity you haven't been zealous for love of me the only reason you suddenly became zealous is for fear of what is to happen to you that is not the character of Christ now as I've said brethren Laodiceans have to do a work. They have to witness for God in order to make it into the kingdom. In Luke chapter 17, would you please notice once again what our Lord and Savior said? Because these are not my words. I'm telling you all of this out of the pages of the Bible, brethren. And uh, not what I'm not willing to scare anyone, but uh, I certainly have to warn all of us that will live in the predominantly Laodicean age. And that the state of lukewarmness is something that is predicted for the last generation of Christians. And that kind of lukewarmness can, you know, affect all of us one way or the other. So Luke chapter 17, verse 33, Jesus Christ tells us, I tell you that in that night they will, there shall be two in one bed. One shall be taken, the other uh, shall be left. Two shall be grinding together, one shall be taken, the other shall be left. One shall be taken and uh, the other left. Two shall be in the field, one taken and the other left. And they answered and said, Where will they be taken, Lord? Because they knew they wouldn't be taken to heaven. He soon said to them, Wheresoever the body is thither, Will the eagles be gathered together? Now, body referring the body in this verse is referring to Jesus Christ. That's the body of Christ, anyway. Um, let me see when the body will return. So that will be that will be indeed. The body of Christ that will be indeed the church and uh, the church of course it's about the body being taken to the place of safety because in Revelation 12 verse 14 we have this prophesied flight of the Philadelphian remnant to the woman the church were given the wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for three and a half years from the face of the serpent meaning from Satan so what happens then well Satan cast out of his mouth waters flood uh, he sends he carried away uh, of the flood and he will, you know, carry the way of the flood destroyed. But the earth will open her mouth and swallow up 
this army of which the dragon cast dragon uh, which the dragon cast after her and in consequence verse 17 the dragon who you know who has been uh, waging the war against the seed of the woman so Satan cast out his mouth out of his mouth water as a flood he sends an army after the woman as she is fleeing that she might that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood or destroyed but the earth will open its mouth it will open her mouth and swallow up this army which the dragon casts after her and in consequence, verse 17, the dragon who has failed to destroy the Philadelphia era, uh, that was now, uh, that was now the, uh, that, that was now protected from, from, his wrath with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of children of Israel so the, the remnant of those who are truly baptized Christians well not only baptized but those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Christ And the Bible tells us, what does the Bible tell us about those people? Well, we have the uh, verse 17, the dragon who has failed to destroy the Philadelphian era that was now protected from him utterly for three and a half years that remained before the return of Jesus Christ. The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which is the remnant of her seed is true Christians, brethren. They're baptized members, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Christ. And the Bible tells us that the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy in Revelation 19.10. So the Lord the Seans understand the prophecies. You know, no wonder they do understand the prophecies. Indeed, they keep the commandments, but it is in a lukewarm fashion. Now, they're members of the church. They're the seed, the children of the woman. And uh, they're begotten brethren, sons and daughters of God. So part of the church is left behind to do a work that they would not do when they had plenty of opportunity to do it and the work that they have to do is a threefold work first of all they'll have to witness to God's way by their refusal to accept the mark of the beast in other words they'll refuse to work on the Sabbath and they will refuse to accept pagan Sunday Now, secondly, the work of the Laodiceans will be to testify to the, the uh, two witnesses being God's true prophets because the two witnesses, brethren, will be doing their work during that three and a half year period. And the third aspect of the work they will do will be the example of courage that, you know, the example of courage that they set through martyrdom because they will testify further to the truth of God's way by the ultimate sacrifice martyrdom you see after the life of ease and spiritual laziness the Laodiceans sadly are going to have to do work of suffering and martyrdom because it is the only way that is going uh, that is a, that a loving father can get them into his kingdom and not have to destroy them forever so he loved them so desperately, you see, God loved them so desperately that rather than just destroy them 
and put them into the third resurrection god is willing to punish them with the tribulation in the hope that they will re uh, remain firm and they will remain steadfast so that he can have so that he can have them for all eternity and never risk losing them again now there are five stages to this experience that the Laodiceans will go through, you see, brethren. The first of these stages is panic. After the remnant of the Philadelphian era is taken to the place of safety, a state of tremendous emotional distress will overwhelm those who are Laodiceans. A state of terrifying anxiety, knowing what they are faced with because they have the testimony of Jesus Christ, meaning they understand the prophecy. You know, God spoke, as we read in Proverbs 1 and verse 27, when your, when your fear comes as a desolation, anyway, They understand prophecy, the, the Laodiceans. And knowing that they are faced with the testimony of Jesus Christ, God spoke as we read in Proverbs 1, verse 27, When your fear comes as a desolation and your destruction comes as the whirlwind, when distress and anguish comes upon you, you see, brethren, they will know what lies ahead and they will know that they face the agony of being separated from their children in this tribulation to come. You know, they know that if they had been Philadelphian, their children could have gone to the place of safety with them. But because they're Laodiceans, their children share their fate. Now, can we imagine the emotional distress that will bring upon a person? Now, it is bad enough knowing the emotional distress that sim simply will bring upon a person. It's bad enough knowing what time, what lies ahead of you, but your children, some of the Laodiceans will not be able to face that and they might commit even suicide. They would rather come up in the third resurrection. And there are people who, who have gone out of the church in a state of apathy suicide is the most way of cowardice indeed now there is a good look that the laodiceans can yet do for dying, dying humanity and there are those who will be affected by their work you see the innumerable multitude will be affected not just by the work of the two witnesses but by the example of the laodiceans who are willing to die, who are willing to die for truth. And uh, people, will be, uh, 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 people will be converted in tribulation as a result of the work of Laodicea, not just because or not just the work of Philadelphia. God's church would much prefer that we, the Philadelphians, to be Philadelphians and that we be Philadelphians for obvious reasons. You know, there'll be the panic. After the panic, the full effect of the female of famine and disease in Ezekiel 5 verse 2, you shall burn with fire a third part in the midst of the city, and so on. So, uh, there, would, there would have been portions of famine and disease, perhaps before, but the full climatic effects take place when the economic sanctions are over. So when the days of the siege are fulfilled, as it says in Ezekiel, you shall take a part, third part, and smite about it with a knife, which is another third of modern Israel. Modern house of Israel is going to die by the sword. Until finally only 10% of Israelites uh, is left now, an unbelievable catastrophe, unparalleled in all of human history. Now, the Laodiceans experience this, but they are protected by 
God from it. Well, they live through it all because they have to die over in another country. So the third stage is that of a warfare. You know, they've been through the famine and the disease, and then the Laodiceans experience the warfare. So the third stage is that of warfare. They've been through the famine and through the disease. And then the Laodiceans experience the warfare where another third of the nations dies. And not to de they do develop zeal through all the suffering that they have, that they see. They do develop a zeal for God. And we can sometimes wonder, how can God allow them to go through all of this if they are his chosen and his begotten people? Well, brethren... It is because God has to. They will see material things in a different perspective. And life would get a different meaning. The four, fourth stage is that of slavery. Because then they are taken into the captivity to Europe and elsewhere. Revelation chapter 6 verse 8, you know, the four stages of slavery. In Deuteronomy 28 verse 68, it says that modern Israel is to be taken in ships to Europe and to Egypt. That was never fulfilled in our in our time, brethren. And many people undoubtedly will die on that way, but not the Laodiceans. God keeps them alive for the work of martyrdom that they must do. And once again, they are preserved. They are put into concentration camps, they're sold as slaves, and then comes the fifth, fifth stage in their lives at this point, and that is that of martyrdom. Revelation chapter 6 and verse 8 deals with the effects of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Now they're given power over a fourth part of the, of, of the earth, to kill with a sword, with hunger, and with death, and with the best of the of the earth. It says then it says in verse nine. When he had opened the fifth seal, I saw on the, the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O God, holy and true, do you not judge and, and, and avenge our blood on them that dwell upon the earth? Verse 12. And white robes, symbolically of course, were given to each and every one of them, and it was said to them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fell servants meaning true servants of God now, because the Laodiceans are no longer lukewarm. They're Christians on fire for God to the point they are ready to die for God. So until their fell servants, uh, until their fell servants die, and their brethren should be killed as they were, and that that should be fulfilled. Now after them comes the 144,000 and the innumerable multitude. Before their martyrdom, they will be faced with tribunals and inquisition and they will have to give their account of why they refuse to recant of their heresy, why they, why they refuse to give up on their religious beliefs. They'll be called to account for their refusal to work on the Sabbath day. Um, they'll be called into the account because of their beliefs. They will be called into the account for their refusal to work on, on, on holidays. And though sometimes they'll be physically kicked and beaten when they, are, when they are brought to the Inquisition, most of them will probably be subjected to refined forms of torture so that when they're brought out to be publicly murdered, they will not look like they have been 
terribly beaten because that probably would reflect upon the authorities and in this day and, and, and age they have modern forms of torture that do not leave marks on a person but we do need to pay tribute at this point brethren to the courage of the Laodiceans that they have come this far because certainly it is harder in a Laodicean state to show this kind of character but as they were as they were influenced by this world and let it take away righteousness from them so they'll be influenced by the world then because this society or our societies if you wish will be totally dying out and that will influence the Laodiceans then when everything is taken from them then they will become zealous for God and for and they will no longer be lukewarm in spirit now God has to do this in his desire to save them from the third resurrection and the eternal death because of his desire to share eternity with him to have them in his kingdom forever and in position of rulership forever as kings and priests God is going to do this what God does here is not an act of cruelty it's an act of love an act of desperation I'm about to spit you out of my mouth they you know just please don't make me do it but if I do this I do it because I love you and I want you to for all eternity in to be in with with me that's basically how God reasons all right now uh, there is one method of execution that is revealed in the Bible for the Laodiceans in Revelation 20 verse 4 the method of death that will be inflicted upon the Laodiceans is described right here in this verse and I saw thrones and they that sat upon them and judgment was given to them and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither had the image, nor received his mark upon their foreheads and on in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Well, better this verse, Revelation 20 verse 4, is true for all Christians of whatever era, but it is a very particularly directed to the Laodiceans for those that were beheaded for the witness because they have to do a work of witness of Jesus and for the word of God which has not worshipped the beast, you see. And in past ages, Christ, well, the past ages Christ was still there and Christians who were followers of Christ, they were burned usually at the stake. Rarely they would be beheaded. Now, true, John the Baptist was beheaded, Paul was beheaded, but for the most part, even in Roman times, they were burned at the stake or cast to wild animals or, you know, and then being eaten alive by those animals. Very few have actually been beheaded. Yet, here it is specific, it specifies beheading. I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and who had not worshipped the beast. So the guillotine is coming back. They use a modern version of it. And these people will be publicly beheaded, you see. So the beast and the false prophet will give warning to the peoples of the land. Recant of any heresy. Do not make the mistake that these foolish individuals have made. Now there is one fact from history that perhaps you did not know. But the Nazi Germany, for those Germans who didn't want to submit to their rule or for those who betrayed the Nazism of Germany the Nazi German authorities would punish them by beheading them you can find several examples of that now keep in mind I said German nationals I didn't say that they would that they would guillotine you know uh, Jews or that they guillotine Jews and others no 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 in the Second World War during the occupation of Europe by the Nazi Germany the Nazi Germans executed German nationals who were anti-Nazis or German nationals who betrayed them in whatever way by beheading them so that kind of practice is not 
is not all that uncommon. It was very common for the German nationals in the Second World War. And uh, any of us can grow lax in prayer and Bible study. But all of us, brethren, any one of us, if we could go forward in time to look directly at the tribulation, to see what Laodiceans are going through, then we might be really stirred to change. Because Jesus said, if the good man of the house had known at what hour his Lord would return, he would have been ready. If he could, you know, if he could have been, if he could have seen the future, if I could take care of you or make a movie, how would the great tribulation look like? If I could do that, brethren, to present to you the truth of the prophecy, uh, you know, if I could do it, it seems that prophecy doesn't grip many people in real way because for them it is not yet a personal experience. Now, if we could go forward in time and see what lies ahead and warn ourselves, this is what's going to happen. You can, you can avoid it. What if 10 years down the line, brother, and I were allowed to see him? What if I was facing the last day of my life? Revelation 20 verse 4 and I could come back in time to myself now and tell myself this is the experience you are going to go through you can avoid it all you know if the good man had known the hour of his Lord's return he would have been prepared for it what if a Laodicean member of God's church about to die in the future in the tribulation could come back now and not just tell himself but tell all of us, what lies ahead? Would it make any difference? Now, who we are does not matter. It is what we are that counts. What if I were a member of a Laodicean church today, brethren? And uh, today is the last day of my life. You know, I walk over to the cell window and I look down into the court right below and there I can see the machine of my execution and I begin to think back over the events that brought me to this moment in time. I remember that awful day when the realization fully came to me that I was a Laodicean the day after the Church of God of Philadelphia had fled to the place of safety. And I wished... And I, we, I was one of those left behind. What would a parent who is Laodicean think about at this point? Now he might remember the terrible knot in his stomach when that realization that hit him with full force for the first time. He had suspected he was a Laodicean but always pushed it back. But now it was facing him in full reality. What about his wife? She could have taken hold of God and prayed and studied at least. If only one of them had been Philadelphian, then their children would have gone to the place of safety. And the children are not now going to have to go through terrible things. Now surely such a parent wouldn't want to live with himself anymore and would want to die. Now he would remember the days of famine that came, the riots in the streets, seeing people go over to supermarkets and uh, and smash the windows. And anyway. He would remember the days of the famine that came, the riots on the streets, seeing people go over to supermarkets and smash the windows and break in to fill their arms with food in some vain hope to stave, stave off the full effects of the famine. But it was food that would only last a little while. And people were even killing each other in the supermarkets for that. And then the disease 
and then the epidemics came the epidemics that might have killed some of their family members perhaps even children well, well perhaps that will motivate Laodiceans to resolve that when that when you know God uh, when God intervenes it will last only a, a while anyway such a parent would remember the days of the famine the riots the mobs in supermarkets and so on and so forth they will fill their, 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 their arms with food in some way in hope to stave off the full effects of the famine, but it was food that would only last a little while. And people were even killing each other in the supermarkets for food. And then the disease epidemics might have also killed some of the, their family members, perhaps their children. Perhaps that will motivate, that, that will motivate resurrection. As they, intended to, as they intended to be there anyway. Now, no matter what lay ahead, they'll go through the bitter end and be a part of the first resurrection so that a thousand years later they could go be there with their children to meet their children. And instead of the misery and the suffering and the sickness that they had been through, to give them abundant living and health and well-being, to try to make up for the happiness, you know, for the misery they had suffered now. In those terrible days, just prior to the Great Tribulation, people may walk on the street near you, brethren, and you would suddenly just collapse. They would suddenly collapse and die, either through being so weakened through lack of food or because of the effects of the plague you know there might be houses that you would walk by and there was the that sickening smell that came from it and you knew they were cooking human flesh fulfilling the prophecies in the bible of cannibalism in the end in the land and you hurried You hurried, you know, by for fear that they might come out and try and take you. <laughs> then came the invasion. God allowed Laodiceans to survive, you know, to survive the basically the famine, the disease, and the warfare, so that he could take them to Europe and make an example of them. The guards will come from them for them and laodiceans will no longer be afraid to face death they'll want death because they would be so sick of this life and so sick of the terror they have been through now there will probably be young people whose parents were church members their parents tried to encourage them to be a part of the youth activities and the other things in the church and they would go along to a certain extent and their parents encouraged them to pray and study but they just resented it and didn't like it they didn't like their parents interest interfere in their life in that way now nobody stops you from praying and studying brethren nobody stops you from laying hold on God because God won't allow nobody not even somebody in your immediate family to stop you from doing that you know you can't point to somebody else else's bad example and say oh well there was this problem and that problem we were all called and given equal opportunity to lay hold upon god you know but in the next second of their conscious of their conscious life the next second of their consciousness they will be there in the first resurrection and what will jesus christ say to the laodiceans Will he upgrade them from their lukewarmness before, from their folly and stupidity, refusal to heed the ser you know the sermons that were given? In those last moments of life, 
as they're about to be beheaded. Laodiceans will be aware of the presence of Jesus Christ, brethren, beside them. Christ who knocked on their door, the door of their hearts and minds. And they'll be filled with a strength and will remember the words, I'll never leave you, never forsake you. And they will be in kingdom of God. You know, they refused to worship the great leader of Europe and didn't bow to the will of the Senate. They will remember another scripture that mostly would keep them going through all the terrible So they'll remember another scripture that most, most, mostly would keep them going through all the terrible things in the Great Tribulation. It kept them, you know, going and helped them hold firm and make it through the to the point of their death. The one who never leaves you would stand beside them with those words. Be you faithful unto death. And I'll give you a crown of life. This was said to the, to the uh, not Sardis, but the uh, Smyrna church. But it's also a message for all the churches indeed. So, uh, the Laodiceans will kept, it will kept them going and help them hold firm and make it through to the point of their death now the one who never leaves them brethren the one who never leaves them, would stand beside the Laodiceans with the words, Be you faithful unto death, and I'll give you a crown of life. If any of us happens to be, happens to be before the European authorities, contrary to what they teach and command, if any of us happens to be there faced with the death penalty, no, 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 don't think we are never alone. He will never forsake you, will never forsake us, nor leave us. And Jesus Christ is always there with the words, Be faithful unto the end, and I'll give you a crown of life. So be encouraged by this, brethren. Yes, we're living in the Laodicean era, but God, out of his immense love for the Laodiceans, will give them the opportunity, the great tribulation, to do their work and to have them qualify, qualify for his kingdom. They'll have the crown of life if they're faithful to the to the death, unto death, and they will be the first resurrection. We must be always encouraged, and I hope we'll strive as hope of Israel to be part of a Philadelphian remnant. Nevertheless, keep in mind it's very easy to compromise. It's very easy to let this world take away from us our righteousness. So. Let us be faithful to death, because what is await for us is a crown of life.